This is the Other 22 Hours Podcast. Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of the Other 22 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron schaefer Hayes, And I'm your other host, Michaela Ann. And we are coming to almost the end of our second year. So thankful to still be here and really grateful that you guys are here with us. If you guys are returning listeners, we have a few quick asks for you before we jump into today's conversation. And we've distilled it down to sharing and subscribing. So the first thing and easiest thing is to please, if you know you like the show, to subscribe on your listening or viewing platform of choice. It's just a great way for people that are browsing by to know that our show is worth 45 minutes of their time. The second thing would be to share. Chances are you heard about our show via word of mouth, and that's the best way to pay it forward. So if you've heard a conversation on here that really resonates with you, if you wouldn't mind just taking a second to share that episode in the same way you found out about it. It's a great way to bring new listeners and the more listeners we have, the more guests we have and the more ideas we can share. And then lastly, if you know that this show really resonates with you, we'd love for you to check out our Patreon. It's a way to support us directly in producing this show, which takes a lot of resources, even for a small show like ours. So we offer all the normal Patreon things and an ever evolving list of things to foster this community and go deeper into what we talk about here on the show. So if that intrigues you, there's a link below in the show notes. And one of the things we really pride ourselves on with this podcast is that we are not music journalists. We are musicians ourselves. So we feel like that makes for a different conversation. One that is more akin to like we're a bunch of friends just sitting around the table sharing what the honest realities are of building a lifelong career around your art. Which is an increasingly crazy thing to do. That's because most of the things in this business are outside of our control. And so with that, we like to focus on what is within our control. Our mindsets, our routines, our headspace, our creativity in general. And so we've been able to distill that down to the question, what do you do to create sustainability in your life so you can sustain your creativity? Today, we got to ask that question of Kevin Kinney. Kevin Kinney is the lead singer and guitarist of Driving and Crying, as well as his own solo projects, but he is driving and crying and has been active in the music business and performing and putting out records for over 40 years. I think he said his first record came out in 81. Yeah, and he started in like 78. So it's been almost five decades now. Yeah, so he has seen a lot. He's been known as a prolific writer with tons of recordings coming out. He's recorded with members of R.E.M., Warren Haynes, John Popper, members of Drive By Truckers. And we've known of Kevin for a long time. But one of our guests, Edwin McCain, talked about his experience and the really positive influence that Kevin has had on him. And uh, when we shared that clip by popular demand, it was clear that people wanted to hear from Kevin Kinney. Yeah. And you can feel that just in our conversation with him. He talks a lot about his mentors, but then also the people that are younger than him that he enjoys being around. Aaron Lee Tazjan, a, a former guest on the show, episode one, actually comes up a lot in this conversation and that's just being here in Nashville and the, the community here. It's very obvious that there are so many people that have come up underneath. I mean, he names Patterson Hood from Drive By Truckers, Jason Isbell, Aaron Lee Tash, and all these people. And all of that kind of works its way to the end of the conversation when he says, I'm local and organic and grass fed. And what he's saying there is work in your circle of influence and build a community and show up as yourself and do your thing and everything will fall in line from there. Or it won't, but just do it and keep doing it. Keep punching your time card and keep showing up. And it's like a really grounding blue collar way of looking at what we do here. Yeah. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Kevin Kinney of Driving and Crying. I would have to say we were talking right before we got on without thought you're like one of our first guests on here by popular demand. We oh. had a conversation with Edwin McCain and he brought your name up and we I just shared it. a little clip of it and everybody was like, <laughs> we love Kevin. Have Kevin on there. We want to hear Kevin. So by popular demand, thank you for being here with us. Wow. I'm very honored. I'm pretty sure I reiterated what the whole point of this podcast is on when I texted you, but just to reiterate it again, talking about basically like the human part of being lifelong career artists. The other 22 how, hours. Yeah. Exactly. Not how do you record, and but like, how do you be a human and sustain yourself? Or for the Allman Brothers, it's the other 20 hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So where, where are you today? You're at home? I'm at home. I live about a mile outside Decatur, Georgia. Okay. Oh, nice. In a little industrial area called Scottsdale, Georgia. Okay. okay. And it's where all the little textile mills used to be. So I live in this weird little textile mill neighborhood. I grew up in Maine, and so that's 
rampant former mill towns are everywhere in Maine, you know, but it's more like paper industry, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm used to that setting. Yeah. I have a song called this train does not, but the mill works anymore. And I wrote it a, a long before I lived on the train tracks in the mill works. <laughs> now I do. Yeah. So God, it came true. <laughs> that was a lot more accurate than I had imagined it to be. There you go. Yeah. Life imitating art, imitating life. Yeah. Yeah. Have you lived in your current spot for a long time? No, just a year. Oh, oh cool. okay. I lived in Atlanta till 92, and then I moved to Athens till 2001, I guess. And then mm -hmm. I lived in Brooklyn till about six years ago, I guess, seven years okay. ago. And then I got remarried five years ago, and I'm here in Decatur now. I was in Atlanta, all over Atlanta mainly in the Virginia Highlands area, if you know what that is. Now mm -hmm. I'm out here in the Millworks. We spent a long time in Brooklyn as well. We were there for 10 11, years. Yeah, 10, 11 years. Oh, you know where you were? I was in Greenpoint. Oh, nice. nice. I love it up there. We have a lot of friends there. We spent most of our time in Ditmas Park, down near Prospect Park, central oh, okay. Brooklyn area. I spent most of my time in Crown all Heights. corners of Prospect Park, the north side of the park, the south side, all around there. Yeah, my yeah. friend Brian Ritchie from the Mad Femmes used to live over there. That's the first time yeah. I were there. Yeah, we met in jazz school. We were both jazz oh. school kids in Manhattan and then started dating and moved in together right out of graduation, much to my mother's jazz dismay. Jazz school. And, <laughs> yeah. We're still recovering. Is that what yeah. it was called, jazz school? <laughs> it was literally called the new school for jazz and contemporary music. Oh, so it's, it's yeah. the new school, which like is okay, a much yeah. larger university and all that. But we went to like the jazz school, which was floors in a building, like 200 kids slammed into two floors. Right. And, that's all they gave us. My sound man went to Berkeley. Okay. He, you can tell. It's a thing. Like I'm music very school. Unimpressed. Yeah. He's <laughs> unimpressed by everything. That's why we say we're recovering. And most of yeah. our friends that we met at school are also still recovering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I'm curious, how has like the different locations and especially now being where you're at, I know you're someone who has consistently been on the road for the majority of your career path, but has where you live and spend your time when you're home, has that kind of informed or changed your creative process depending on where you're at in life? I don't know. Not really. I'm constantly running away from myself and I keep winding up waking up next to myself. I can't really yeah. do it. But creatively, what re usually happens is I'm a collector. Basically, I just collect ideas as I move and try to remember conversations. And now with these new things on the phone where I can record an idea or I can write it down in the notebook, that's very helpful to me because I have a lot of sweeping, ongoing kind of like ideas that come and go. I mean, what affords me here, living here, is I have a nice backyard and I got four dogs, so I walk them. The stress of walking them and making sure that they're safe and <laughs> they don't get hit by cars and clears your mind. So I try to do it first thing every day to just clear my mind to get out of the house, don't look at the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To just be aware. You know, I'm always trying to write constantly. Sometimes it's just terrible and sometimes it's fun. But I try mm -hmm. to remember I've written a bunch of songs lately about my dog. We'll see how that translates into America. Because usually when I write, I try to keep everything very general. Like, I don't do specifics. Like, I rarely use a politician's name or a circumstance's name. Vietnam War, maybe I will I use that. But I mean, I try to just keep everything a little enigmatic and fluid. Like, I write about my hometown a lot when I'm living down in Georgia, growing up in the Midwest. I was thinking today, like, I wish I had better posture and I wish I had a better idea of body image or being a pro. Or, But I was never meant to be a musician that was supposed to be on stage. I was supposed to be a factory worker that mm -hmm. cut a finger off and got unemployment. And I was never supposed to be here. You know what I mean? So I'm kind of like always in a world of I'm not sure if I'm he or he's... You know what I mean? It's a little psychotic out there doing this since my first single came out in 1981. So it's been like mm -hmm. 43 years I've been chasing this thing and wondering where I belong or who, who I belong to or what's the point? I don't even yeah. know. <laughs> but I mean, I get validated. Like you say, I saw Edwin on your show and I was like, oh, that is so sweet to him. And he's a really great one of the a humanitarian and a great friend of mine. It doesn't really matter where I am. I would never write about the beach at the beach. I would probably write about the beach in New York. I try to soften the edges. I don't like to be real literal. John got up and John did this and John did that. And then he went over here and then that's what happened. I'm trying to like, well, the colors of the leaves are, I'll give us some clues as to what season it is and what his temperament is and maybe what his vibe is. Like that song, this train don't stop with the mill works anymore. It's really just about a woman who, who's working in a parachute factory in, that, in World War II. And when the war ends, you know, she still work at the factory, but then they decide to get cheaper labor. My sister's dealing with that right now. Like she's working at a 
company. They're exporting the jobs to Mexico mm -hmm. and she sees how much they're paying these people and they're paying them like $10 a day. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh my God, it's just terrible. I can't say that, but I say it in the midst of a woman who whose identity was all wrapped up in the, having this really cool job where she made parachutes and she would go to the movies and she would like see the previews of the war films and she'd be like, that's a parachute. I made that parachute. And she felt connected Purposeful. to this. Purposeful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you went to a place that I'm curious about. You mentioned the identity stuff. After 40 years of doing this, you questioning like what you should look like if you're someone that's on stage that's right. performing. And do I fit that role? And what am I doing? And I'm so curious about that stuff, especially as many years into it as you are, because I, I always wonder if some people just have like a self-assuredness. Some of us are just plagued for life to always feel like misfits. <laughs> <laughs> we just got off tour with the Black Crows. We did a tour with them and we grew mm -hmm. up with them. In our early punk days, they were we all lived in the same apartment building. We all supported each other. But Chris Robinson is a rock star. He is a mm -hmm. full-on rock star. He is great at it. He mm -hmm. could talk to the audience. Ed Rowland, rock star, great rock star. Michael Stipe, Bono. They get out there and they just embrace that crowd. They can talk to the crowd and they're like lead singers. Edwin is good at it too. Just really great at connecting with an audience. Rarely do I feel that way. I just really want to practice with my band and then you can watch it. It's basically what you're doing with John McCry. It's like, you're coming yeah. to watch us rehearse for the show that we're never going to do. <laughs> so, and uh, the only guarantee I guarantee my audience at some point in the night, you will be disappointed in this performance. <laughs> There'll be a song you don't like. There'll be a song that you like that I did play the right way or I played it too fast. I added a story, but it wasn't the story you were expecting. Mm -hmm. or, so I will guarantee you that I will disappoint you in some way, shape, or form somewhere in the night. And hopefully I will yeah. make up for it somewhere also in between there. I hear that and I hear self assuredness in that. You're like, we're just going to show up as we are fully. This is what we are, you know, yeah. versus things I hear from people that maybe can only measure their career in one decade versus four, you know, where it's like, how do I manipulate what I'm doing so that it fits that? You're just like, here we are. Take it or leave it. When I am that guy, the other people don't like it. They don't want to see me go like, hey, Atlanta, how y'all doing? Let's rock and roll tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm not that guy. And, and yeah. then when I say it, they're like, that was weird. <laughs> What did you do? That? <laughs> Who is you know this? what I mean? Like, okay. Has that evolved? Has that approach for you? Has it always been that? Or has that evolved as you've been at this for longer? It's always kind of been there. I, you know, I started off my first band called The Prosecutors. My best friend, Doug LaVallier, who was the roadie. We were both roadies for this band called The Haskells and The Oil Tasters mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, 1978, 39. We just started our own little band on the side for fun. So that's where it all started. I'm still like a guitar tech. When I was out with the Black Crows, I was still taking pictures of all of their gear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting with the roadies and just thinking like, here I am, I'm like a roadie, but I got like a, a plus sign or like a roadie plus. <laughs> <laughs> I get all the amenities. I have a song that I sing when I do folk shows. It's like, I just come here to sing to myself. And that's kind of mm -hmm. what I started doing when I started this band, which driver crying like mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we have is this self-help, self-healing rock and roll. Like we always took rock mm -hmm. and roll. And there's not a lot of like let's get down and party and drink and Jack Daniels and all that. There's mostly it's mostly introspective self-help healing things like Scarbridge Martyr was our very first song. Right there it tells you nobody said this would be fair. They warned you before you went out there. There's always a chance to get restarting to a new world and a new life scarred but smarter. Mm -hmm. And that's the first song that I wrote for this band is I sing it every night. I'm trying to help myself. I'm trying to heal myself, which is what I try to tell people about music in general. Whether mm -hmm. anybody sees you play it or not, you and your husband, or you and your wife, you and your dog, or nobody. Just music is a very healing thing, you know, as you know. It just feels so good to express yourself and let it out and then let it move. I didn't let the fact that I didn't want to be on stage inhibit the fact that I wanted to sing to myself. So I'm just singing to myself. If you ever see movies of us or pictures of us, at the end of a song, I never accept the audience's approval. <laughs> I always turn my back. And I don't want to say I don't care, but I really don't care if you care. If you're applauding the fact that, I, hey, you did good. I enjoyed that. That's cool. I don't have to have it. I'm uncomfortable with, with applause and things like mm -hmm. that. You know, I like it, but I'm never going to be like, yeah, bring it up. Come yeah. on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> bring it up. Let's hear you. Let yeah. Hear you. Yeah. 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 I love hearing this stuff because I also, through all these conversations that we get to have, I'm a 
singer songwriter and perform and put out records and Aaron's a I want to say was a drummer is still a drummer but now primarily produces records but <laughs> has been on stage and toured forever and so over the years you start to get to know like there's so many different ways to do the business but also to present yourself. But we still kind of adhere to this idea of, oh, that way, the rock star way is what you're supposed to embody. And then I think some of us start to realize over time, either that's natural for you or not. I've been in a process of being like, that's not my vibe either. I tell like emotional right. stories on stage and I'm much closer right. to the like, let's all sit close together and let me sing some emotional songs to you and we can connect and maybe cry like that kind of thing. And it's taken me a long time to accept it. I've learned I love hearing from people like you because we also see through this podcast the people who are very much like this is me. It might not fit into the rock star format. Maybe they have a smaller audience than you two. But the people who connect with you, like we saw on just <laughs> sharing that Edwin McCain clip, deeply connect. Right. And that's what I think is really beautiful when you like as an artist, when you start to reconcile like what I think I need to do to try to gain a career and what is really authentically me is when you start to find the people who are like, oh, I really like that thing. I like that he's super honest. It's two different things. Being an artist and being a business person are two different things. So mm -hmm. my daughter had piano lessons as an example for years. And her piano teacher liked to have recitals because she wants to show her 10 students. And also she's kind of recruiting new people. Like, here's what I can do. My daughter pulling her out of the car. She did not want to do it. So eventually I just told her, like, you don't have to do this. And yeah. then I told her teacher, I said, I really want you to teach her piano. If she feels like she wants to learn how to be on stage, I'll call some of my friends. <laughs> so like, be on stage. I'm not one mm -hmm. of them. But it's two totally different things. People who want to perform and people who want to create music. I don't think not being wanted to be on stage should keep you from writing music. It's very important to channel yourself, even if it's a terrible song or whatever it is. I always taught my kids just write. Right, you mean? Don't slam doors. Just go downstairs and write a song about how much you hate me. Totally cool. Yeah. I'm totally cool with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me hear it. Yeah. You know, I don't mind. Has that happened? Have they written songs? Not that they've sung to me. Yet, no, but yeah, uh, yeah. You know, he's like 32 years old now, or 33, and he works in the Tyler Perry Studios building sets and stuff like that. But he's also a great cool. punk rock drummer, you know. There's so many different things. So I'm, I totally love the rock star thing. I'm not one of them. I love I, every night we do the Black Crows. I sat in the audience and I enjoyed it. I thought that yeah. there was somebody I admire that they can do this. And that's so great. And, and there's people like Peter Buck who just have never gone a week without playing, has made numerous records and performed on numerous records since REM broke up. And he's just a real role model for me. REM could do a stadium if they wanted to, but I don't think they want to. It's up to them, but it doesn't keep them from getting in the van, driving in the white little mm -hmm. van. He can afford a tour bus by himself, but he doesn't. He stays with the van. He does the merch, he works hard. And so it's one of my role models is Peter. Peter mm -hmm. has really been a huge influence on me as far as we produced my first solo record in 1988. I have a lot of good mentors, people like Warren Haynes, people like Peter Bach and the Mike Mills. I mean, I am also very humbled to know the people that are in the other graduating class, Edwin and mm -hmm. Ed Roland and people like that, who I really learned from younger, Aaron Lee Tashton, Jason Isbell, Patterson Hood, all of my colleagues that are maybe younger than me, aren't 63 yet. But I think it's important for people like me to keep learning and keep moving forward. And I have a song called Ian McClagan that's about it, about Ian McClagan, who was in the Small Faces, and he played mm -hmm. with the Rolling Stones, he played with everybody. If you knew anything about him, he moved to Austin 20 years ago, whatever. He, he's passed away since, obviously. He just played with every local band that came in, and you could invite him to play with you. He played every Monday or Tuesday night. Uh, he could have just sat at the pub and sat at the bar and been like, I was in the Rolling Stones and Rod Stewart Faces, drinks on me, or everybody buy me a drink, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he didn't. He got out there. I never got to meet him, but the last time I was on a bill, where he was on a bill, he was playing in the afternoon with Peter Buck, and Steve went from the Dream Syndicate out this bag with Scott McCoy. Young Fresh Fellows, I think it was. Anyway, so I pull up and there's Ian McClay walking up the alley with his amplifier, his keyboard under his arm in the rain. Yeah. Like, I'm like, did I just miss Ian McClay? He said, yeah, that's it. We're like, that's Ian McClay carrying his own crap up the alley yeah. in the rain <laughs> after playing at one in the afternoon. Yeah. To fucking hungover people at South by Southwest. That's so inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm only as good as my last whatever it is, I don't know, last yeah. year. You brought up, you were supposed to be a factory worker, a mill worker, blue collar thing. It seems like that mentality 
carries through everything. It's a respect for the work and a respect for the job and just doing the job and showing up and doing it consistently. Yeah, I mean, it's in the back of my head always, how bad can this be? I get my own hotel room. I mean, I don't know. It is tempered by the fact that at five minutes before I go on stage, I'm standing on the side of the stage and I'm thinking to myself, this is the absolute last place in the world I want to be right now. <laughs> this is I can the with that. I do yeah. not want to go up there. I do. And then you just, you really learn a lot from being a swimmer. You just yeah. got to go. Once you get in the water, you're like, oh, I can't believe I haven't been in the water all day. That's how it is for me. I'm like, oh God, I really don't want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> That's the two hours that I'm working. The other 22 hours, I'm cataloging and writing and trying to think of something to say. After 200 songs, I'm trying to think of another way to say what it is that I'm trying to say. Who to say it to? I got a new set of record songs coming out, but I don't know how how they're going. They tested okay. What's like a percentage of songs that you write versus that finally make the cut? Are you somebody that overwrites and then picks from there? Or is it generally, if you're going to finish the song, it's going to make an appearance? I, yeah, I'm about 80%, 85% mm-hmm. probably will make it onto something. Mm-hmm. But that's why I started this band that I could do a solo, own solo things. Mm-hmm. Just some songs that I've been writing lately that just, I don't know if they're going to work for Jarry Crying or they're just going to wind up as acoustic tracks on Jarry Crying and then no one's going to listen to them. You're like, <laughs> here's a pretty song next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's easier doing the solo stuff for me. To write with the band is I have to have the band there. Like, it's really mm-hmm. hard for me to write band songs. Mm-hmm. So that's where sound checks come in handy and the voice memo on my phone comes handy. And just channeling or just whatever, just the catalog of things that sweep through your brain. You know, like when the Beatles started, they had Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and then they had like Bossa Nova beats. You know, they had like that cha-cha-cha kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And they had 50s rock and roll. That was pretty much what they had to draw from. As it moves through on, then the, the late 60s bands have that to draw from. They also have, now they have a little bit of electric music coming in. They got Big Bomb of Thornton. They got oh, Dwayne Eddy. They got a little bit more. They got the Beatles. And now you got Sgt. Pepper to follow. Then by the time you get to me, you got Ramones. All these influences. So it's like, I'm influenced by so much. It's uh, very hard for me to focus on one particular genre. So I just have let myself go and be mm-hmm. free to do whatever I want to do. But I've learned that trying to write a good rock song really is something I have to have the band to do. I, it's really hard for me to sit at my table and write a good rock song. Yeah. I have to be inside the jet engine to make it work. Did starting these multiple streams like Driving and Crying and then your solo thing, did this come out of having songs and not having an outlet for them? Or did it come out of wanting to chase this outlet and then needing to have songs for that? You know, when we first started, the first interviews I ever did was like, we're the band that's like your record collections. I was inspired by the replacements and Bad Brains. And the Bad Brains were like heavy metal and then reggae. I thought, that mm-hmm. is genius. And they could do all these different genres. I wanted to be a band that was like a really good mixtape. And mm-hmm. I'm cool with that. It's so much easier to write folk songs, though, and pretty songs, and that can make you cry. But usually I'll make myself cry, too, so it's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I still cry when I hear I'll be in the grocery store. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Edward McCain, the bastard. He made me cry at Walmart more than anything. Um, I love that. Tell me. So good. It's a great so melody, good. too. Have you ever had stretches of time where you haven't felt like you've been able to write? Yes. I embrace those times. Okay. Yeah, I don't fight it. I just let it come. And if it comes, it comes. It doesn't come. It doesn't come. But, you know, I've said what I have to say, so I don't really have to. Mm-hmm. But I think so I don't rarely have those feelings anymore. Okay. Usually what I'll do is I'll write a song about writing a song. Like that song I wrote, I've just come here to sing to myself from what I took off my shelf from under my bed till I cleared my head and I was ready to listen. That was one of those songs I wrote coming out of trying to write a song or whatever. Like, I don't, mm-hmm. the first line I think is very important in writing a song. I think the first line is important to remember it and also set the stage, you know. Mm-hmm. But what more can I say? I've said it all. I've said everything mm-hmm. I needed to say. Yeah. yeah part of a new way to say it. it. would probably be the like first line of a song if I really needed to write a song. That would probably be the first line I would write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what to write. Yeah. I don't know who cares. I don't know who's listening. <laughs> When you're saying, if I need to write a song, is it like a practice like that? Do you approach writing songs like it's a job to show up and get these out? Or is it a need like a internal, you know, kind of? No, I don't care. I don't have a record company anymore that needs product or anything like that. I just let it go. Hopefully some of this stuff comes through channeling or just leaving myself open for other people to come through me. I feel like that's happened a few times. Some songs have just appeared. I don't touch them. I just let them fall out. But that's probably all in my head. I don't know. It's all all in there somewhere because I listen to a lot of music. 
you know, going back to what you said, it was like by popular demand. But, you know, I'm a music fan. I think I'm friends with a lot of musicians because I really support musicians. I really love to go see them play. I support my friends. I always buy their records. I always pay to go see them unless it's sold out. I'm a music fan. First of all, I started off being a music fan. When I was 14 years old, I went and saw, you know, the Rolling Stones and it was $10 to see them. It was a big deal. So... And loving music and learning how people work with it, you know, I'm inspired by their new record. Like, why did Ed Roland and why did Click This All make in the ninth record? Okay, that's good. I see that. I can get into that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what inspires them to keep moving on and keep writing songs? And, you know, right now, my wife has put together this project. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's called Let's Go Dancing. Have you heard about this? Mm-mm. I'm not. There's two volumes of it, and there's going to be there's going to be even more. What it is is all Jarring Cryan songs re-recorded by people as a benefit record. Cool. It's on Anna Jensen. Uh, you can find it. It's called Let's Go Dancing. Is Aaron Lee on one of those? Yeah, he's on uh, the next one. Cool. My brother, Elizabeth Cook, Butch Walker, Darius Rucker, Jesse Malin, Chutney from BR549, Jimmy Vivino, Anna Kramer, Mike Ferris is on this one, and uh, the guy from Five Blind Boys of Alabama. It's a cool record, and she's got, there's going to be four eventually. There's two out now. It's fun to listen to those records. I'm going off on a tangent where I was going in it, but they're all different versions. Like, a lot of people have deconstructed this song and made it much better. <laughs> so, it's mm-hmm. fun to listen to what I was really stubborn about recording the record, and I remember, and the reason I call it Let's Go Dancer was, it's the one song that has been of my catalog, there's so many people have been like, that's a great song, or that song should have been a hit, or that's this guy, Andy Johns, who worked with Zeppelin and Van Halen, and, you know, the Stones. The day before he's supposed to record, he called and canceled and said, hey, Andy, he had to go to rehab. Oh, uh, God. Uh, he went where he met Eddie Van Halen, and then they made yeah. 1984, or some big record. Wow. I remember he loved that song, and I was always wondering what it would be like if he did it. And then Emily Harris was like, I love that song, Disco Dance. And I was like, yeah, that's a good <laughs> but uh, Leon Wilkinson from Skinner, when we play with them, every night he's on the side of the stage, was like, you play, let's go dance. And I was like, sure. So I don't know what it is about that one song. So that anyway, that every record starts off with a version of that. But I was really listening to what producers were trying to tell me. And then I was like, I don't do it that way or I can't learn it. And then hearing people really deconstruct it, like David Ryan Harris from Fall For Now, played with John Mayer for a while. He did a song called Good Day Every Day. And a lot of these are, I have a Spotify playlist called Let's Go Dancing, if you can check it out. Mm-hmm. All the songs are on there. It's really cool. Let's, he did an amazing version of the song that was like, not a uh, song that I was hated playing. And he turned it, he totally turned it upside down. So I guess if anything, I'm inspired to write more songs that are not up to quality that someone else can re-record and fix. <laughs> it's my, yeah. it's my new go hole. I love it's, that. My next record should be called Shit You Can Fix. It's, an, it's an interactive Ed, piece. Yeah. Edward McCain did an amazing version of a song called Powerhouse that was mm-hmm. just, they hear him scream. His fans would not know it was him. Yeah. Was yeah. Totally out of his element. You mentioned in there, producers would ask you to do it a certain way, and you're like, no, nah, I can't do that. I want to hear more about that. Was it more that just like you weren't hearing that idea? You were hearing your song a certain way. You're like, no, we're doing it this way. Yeah, I don't think I was trained properly like i don't think i had the right i'm not a musician i don't know how to play music like i'm not <laughs> you'll never see me like sitting in with somebody i don't know it's a d diminished the ninth and then gotcha. it, it goes it you know transitions to the seventh mm-hmm. but there's the augmented ninth in there i'm like not a clue what'd you say yeah. d i know where yeah. the d is yeah and they're like well you're playing it that's what that is like oh it's a g i pick up my finger I is that yeah you play that's an automatic knife they're like oh okay i guess Good. i do know that one but if you're shouting it off to me in the middle of the thing i don't know what it means so mm-hmm. in saying that when i get into the studio and he's saying to me timing is really hard for me you know i worked with anton fear for three records and he was like you could not please well, I guess you can't please it, but you had to please them by being yourself, but also being perfect, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is really hard for me. And I know a lot of people dealt with it pretty good. I know a lot of people who would have just walked out, a lot of people mm-hmm. that did, but I couldn't be mad at him because he knew he knew me better than me. Like, I recorded it, and then I went out, and I did whatever, and I would go back in the studio. He's like, while I was out running around doing whatever, he was listening to that song over and over and over and learning how the song should be. What's wrong with this song? It's too fast. It's too busy. That part doesn't need to be there. It's too mm-hmm. long. He's saying that too many times. 
You should say that more. You could put a bridge in here and a chorus here and slow it down, speed it up, move it on, get it on. And I'm just not open to that because I'm not a musician. I wish I loved being in the studio, but mm -hmm. I, I would rather go to the dentist than go to the recording studio. I don't <laughs> It was hard to get to a dentist. Than a <laughs> so Anton would throw these things out and you would just reject the idea and say no. Well, Anton, and you weren't going to reject it. You're going to you're gonna sit there until you figured it out. And then it would be mm -hmm. your best that you could do. And then you would come in and it would be really great. And somebody else had played it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I love this, though. I, f I feel like our social media clip of this conversation should just be Kevin <laughs> Kinney from Driving and Crying. I'm not a musician. <laughs> I'm not a musician. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I know where the capo is, and I know I play the G and the C and the D and A minor. B's are really hard. F sharp is good if I'm rocking, standing up. You know, like I say, I just feel so good after the show's over. I feel mm -hmm. so good while I'm doing it. It really does heal me to sing to myself. It really mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. really, really helpful to my mental health to be mm -hmm. able to vent and share and then by default have other people come and share that they have a similar thing it's not mm -hmm. like i'm writing songs for inuit or people in brazil rainforest i'm ready for americans that mm -hmm. grew up like i watching good times and happy days so it's not like i don't know if i'm a universal thing i'm an american artist that really rarely leaves the south anymore i really just do midwest and northeast northwest once a year maybe mm -hmm. but you know i'm not a big american touring i'm big in france basically i got <laughs> south yeah. amazing dicks in line <laughs> yeah east of the mississippi that's like my territory if you want to see driver crying you should probably come to us because we totally will come to you <laughs> i think we retired from boston and new york and <laughs> buffalo and cleveland we're probably yeah. never gonna go there yeah we're opening for somebody and that's okay yeah it's that's so okay works. with me it's totally okay. We've talked about this many times on this podcast. The idea that, okay, if you're going to be a touring musician, you have to go everywhere. And it's like, well, why? What if you identify the places you really want to go and like where you really connect to people and zero in on that? And why does it have to be covering every territory possible so that you're just like running yourself ragged year after year after year? Yeah. And it's very expensive yeah. it to do anything. I mean, a hotel room is $150. I would take a guess is $100. So there's yeah. 250 at the top. If you're only making $300 at an open mic, you're already in the hole. Yeah. yeah. In Atlanta and Athens in January, I'll be doing a residency. I'm going to work on these songs and playing it once a month at Eddie's Attic and at this place in Athens. I'm just going to play once a month in the same place so people can find me, mm -hmm. people can come to me, and we can have a conversation and give you an opportunity to be disappointed and then come back and be <laughs> firmly disappointed right here. Yeah. Because I'm not always going to play the song. I mean, I can't possibly play 170 songs. Well, I'm, yeah. yeah. I want to irritate somebody. What keeps ringing in my head, you know, you sing these songs for yourself. You're trying to heal yourself. It's you're showing up in this authenticity that then gives everybody else permission to show up as themselves, you know? And that's what I see with people like, like Aaron Lee Tazden to keep bringing him up or John Moreland, who was just a recent guest. Yeah. The people that just, they just show up as themselves and they're like, here I am, warts and all. I'm singing my songs and this is how I'm doing it and show up or don't show up. And it just like creates this energy in the room or this acceptance of everybody just like, cool. They don't have to put on a mask. They don't have to like put on any pretension. It's just like, I'm just going right. to show up as me. And that's a special, unique thing that we can do as artists. I think it is and nothing against anybody else that wants to show up with face mask or whatever mm -hmm. it's like I enjoy anybody who's being real mm -hmm. yeah fully I think Kiss is as real as Bob Dylan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree it has that. just as much of an influence and it changes people it makes people happy just as mm -hmm. much as Bob Dylan John Denver is just as valid as Charles Van Zandt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both great both different both hit different heartstrings yep there's so many different vibrations within a single note, you know, mm -hmm. as being trained Institute of Music <laughs> <laughs> students. Hopefully that was the first thing you learned was like, if everybody walks in the room and hits a G note on the guitar, they're all going to be different. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Be softer, harder. Someone's got vibrato. Someone is all going to be different. Just mm -hmm. one single note. And then you add the hundreds and thousands of other notes in there. One of the negatives of going to music school is the pretension that can come with it. In my experience, it felt like they were trying to train us to be like, this is good music and this is bad music. And I grew up loving pop music. 
like what you were saying, like I get massive enjoyment out of listening to Shania Twain and the Spice Girls of my youth and like whatever. And then also and like dancing around and then listening to a really introspective, heavy, emotional folk song, Towns Van Zandt or Guy Clark. But we can in some places classify that's bad taste and this is good taste and it ruins so much enjoyment and I spent years not letting myself enjoy what I truly enjoyed because I thought it made me less than and it's taken me a long time to be like fuck that I like what people call bad music and I like what some people call good music and I'm not vibing with some music that people tell me is like the greatest music ever like because we're all different and we all like vibrate with different things I think that my friend's who have been to Juilliard and Berkeley, and I think Aaron Lee Tashin went to Berkeley for mm-hmm. a little while. Mm-hmm. I think the struggle for y'all is a lot harder for, than me. I've always just been me. The little bit of time that I had this been with Anton Fear, it was like going to graduate school without going to high school. He was so far above me, it was hard for me to catch up. And the musicians that he had, like, oh, he's his guy, Tony Shearer, he's going to play guitar on this, but he's the bass mm-hmm. player from Goliath. Like, you know, you know that, yeah. right? I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I don't. And I could <laughs> build a torch to. I've got all these people that are like Catherine Popper and all the early Tashton and the, the Mastersons in there. And watching musicians talk amongst themselves is, is just really beautiful. But I think it's harder to become Picasso. What made Picasso great was, yes, Picasso could paint like Rembrandt. He'd learn the techniques to learn to recreate a masterpiece. Then he had to say, well, I can do that. Like Aaron Tashton, he can do all that. But then for Aaron to become who Aaron is now is another level past that. The Aaron is so unique now. He's writing, he's not writing Americana. He's writing this really interesting, like, space pop. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how to describe it. He could use all of his best friends in Nashville and make an Americana record that would challenge anybody else's Americana record. It doesn't feel right to him. He wants mm-hmm. to be himself. He wants to say what he wants to say in his way of saying it. I think this is really hard to do once you've been trained, like y'all have been trained or whatever, to break out of that, to deconstruct yourself with all this knowledge. And I mean, I know because I hear it in Anton Fear, like, and a lot of the things that I learned from him carry over into things like the studio. Like, don't bring food in my fucking studio. This is not where you eat. Mm-hmm. Don't take phone calls. Turn your phone off. Don't watch TV. Come here and listen mm-hmm. and then record and then leave. Mm-hmm. Don't bring all this. Don't bring your friends. Ding, ding. Dip. <laughs> no <laughs> Don't hummus. bring shit into my fucking studio. And it, that really resonated with me later. I mean, I learned that back in the 80s. But I was like, yeah, you're right. This is not a place. I mean, if I do a session and people want to do that and it becomes a fun hang and whatever, we're making music and I can allow myself to do that. He could not do that. Mm-hmm. But that's where that's where I'm saying I have this level of what I hear in my head is right. But I can also deconstruct that and be like, that's not always right. It depends mm-hmm. on the circumstance. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let that go. I know that I'm not supposed to play that fast. I know I'm supposed to change time signature. I know I'm not supposed to let this get faster towards the end or escalate. That's not the right way to do it. And you have to say, no, that's the way I want to do it. And that's yeah. the way I'm hearing. And so it's hard to dismiss what your masters have taught you to be yourself. It's not fucking easy to do, but I've grown comfortable. Like I say, I'm totally cool with disappointing you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I have also been learning through this record that I'm not always right. Mm -hmm. I was totally wrong. I should have listened to you. I should have floated down there. Why did I think I knew what I was doing? These are epiphanies that are hitting me three, four years ago. And some of it's hitting me this week. And I'm 64 years old. I've been doing this since 1980, Mm -hmm. 1978, I started. So a lot of this stuff, it took me a long time to really embrace because, you know, it's hard to be yourself sometimes it is it's a constant practice you know it's not a one and done kind of thing yeah it's not a switch yeah well you know tying it back to going to music school when you're literally getting a grade for your learning how to create art it sets you up from the very beginning with an attachment to what the judgment of your work is which can limit and prohibit like how safe you feel to explore and try to learn who you are and then you enter the real world and there's a million ways that the world does that to you anyways the internet comments the press whatever but again it goes back to like referencing people like you and like Aaron Lee Tajjan like Aaron's a friend but also I'm a huge Aaron fan because from the beginning of hearing him I was like oh that's somebody who's himself and it like really resonated with me where I always want to cry when I hear him sing because it just feels like he's like letting us in and that's not something that you can train people to do we all have to 
evolve at our own pace to be able to embody that. He's also not afraid to fall in love with an artist and try to emulate them. You can tell if he's been listening to the Wallflowers all week. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and that's okay, because that's basically what I'm doing. I listen to Robert Trower and the Ramones. I'm trying to beat, that's what I'm trying to do. He's never afraid to just be like, yep, all I've listened to is Big Star this week. This show's going to be like a Big Star show. You know, that's one of the things I love about Aaron, too, is he just really is never afraid to be himself as mm-hmm. far as just maybe being goofy or being whatever it is that he is or letting it go. He's played guitar with Robert Kaya for a good bit, and we've played together a lot, a lot. And he's just really good at channeling to just come up with parts. It's really mm-hmm. great to watch him do that. Yeah. Well, and like you said, being an artist and being a business person are two separate things. Being an artist is exploring and trying on different things. Sometimes when you have to put on your like music business hat, that might not be the wisest move because you're confusing markets and whatever. It's like the value of just exploring for yourself, your own art. Well, I'm learning my wife. Every week she has a new single out from this project. And every week she's struggling with, you can't put this on TikTok with you have too many words or you can't put this on this and you can't put that on that. When I talk with Aaron, like Aaron asks for my advice sometimes and I have to say, be yourself, be cool, do a residency. I don't know the things that I learned how to do in 1978 that I carried that I learned my whole life about getting a good demo tape and then getting it to the right person and doing a great show and then getting on the label and they're gonna have none of that exists anymore none of it exists producers don't get paid thirty thousand dollars anymore you don't have to make a hit record in a recording studio you don't have to spend any time or money on it it could just have a great idea put it on your laptop and then put it out there tomorrow none of my advice works anymore my only advice to anybody who's doing this is if it's working and you're happy with it just don't fuck it up for the sake of fucking it up like i did you know <laughs> like i was just like I kind of got ahead of myself and I didn't appreciate having a publicist, having mm-hmm. a record company pay for a publicist until I had my own record company. I was like, how do I get this? Oh, 5000 <laughs> a week? Oh, <laughs> Jesus. I was the- We're going to take better advantage of that situation. I did not know that. Oh, boy. How much is the studio? Really? Yeah. How much is better than the studio? Wow. I would have stole a lot more. Oh, it's free. <laughs> I would not have walked in on over at three in the afternoon. I would have, would that have been over at 10? Oh, wow. I just should have been there. <laughs> you know, my only advice to the people is appreciate what you have at this moment. Mm-hmm. Because as much as you have, too, it can also go away very quickly. There's just so many people who want that space right now. There's millions of people going to do it. If it's working, just stick with it. You want to be yourself. But also Mm -hmm. be appreciative of what you have when you have it, because when you don't have it, it, you can't always get it back. I hate to say it, but I don't know if that even matters anymore. Just, I guess you just keep fishing for TikTok videos and things like that. You know, I don't know. Aaron was under a lot of pressure from his record company to create a new TikTok every week. And I was like, well, I don't know. Here's a write a list of things that, I don't know, bake a cake on Monday. (laughs) Do a picture of you baking a cake and then fly (laughs) tight, change your tire. Oh my God. uh, Change your batteries in your radio. Here I am on TikTok. And I, I would run out of things to do to yeah. become a viral yeah. distribution. I don't, there's only so many recipes I have that did not exist. Like Bruce Springsteen, when he first started, until Dance in the Dark, he never saw Bruce Springsteen. He was never on TV. He was never on Midnight Special, Don Christian's Rock Concert. You could not see Bruce Springsteen unless you went to see his show. End of wow. story. You have to buy a ticket and wait. And it was really a great era. I really love that era, which is why I try to thank the audience every night for like getting out of your house and coming mm-hmm. down here to support live music because you know what? I'm not taking that for granted because I've been through COVID. It can go away. Mm-hmm. People yep. can stop coming. So I was just really appreciative of I try not to upset the apple cart too yeah. much. I leave politics out of yeah. it. I'm <laughs> not good at that either. What mm-hmm. a different world, though. It's so drastically different from 1970s and 80s and 90s, even right. 2000s, like today's. Yeah. Even 2018. Yeah. And I you know, I love all that. Like, Taylor Swift really was huge before she had records out, I think. I mean, I know Billie Eilish was my granddaughter was talking about her way before she was. we saw her anywhere. Her brother and her made records in her room. In the 70s, you would have never got that. Right. I guess the quality wasn't going to be there. But there's no way you would have got 
an audience at all because you had to do the record company and you had to go visit the record stores. And yeah, mm-hmm. up until the 90s or late 2000s, you couldn't buy a record at a concert. We were not allowed to sell music at our concerts. Oh, interesting. You could only buy t shirt. You could never buy an album of a band at a concert. You had to direct it to, the, to the record store. Yeah. Whoa, I didn't know that. It's very rare to see huh. anybody sell any music at a concert. Wow. Crazy. That makes sense, but I, I that never fired off in my head. Yeah, so when you saw that great concert, you had to get your car the next morning yeah. and Drive. go yep. to Turtles and buy, and hopefully they have that in stock. Yeah. It was a cool era because it made you want things, you know. When did you covet your best oh, friend's yeah. record? Right. Talk about being grateful for what's there. It's like everybody just assumes that everything is available all the time, anywhere, for free. For free. And for free, you know, on Spotify. Yeah. It's just, I have no advice for anybody. I mean, I made a solo record two years ago. It came out, I guess, or maybe more, maybe four years ago. Anyway, I don't know how to make people listen to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's there. I can't afford the publicist to, like, I don't really know how to even advise myself. My wife is doing this thing with the Let's Go Dancing thing, and it's really... And we've hired publicists and we've hired teams and your publicist is really only as good as their best act. And, you know, the publicist, it seems to me like they take 10 artists if two get attention and the other eight pay for the two that get attention until the next time you hire them. And then maybe you're in the lottery and maybe you could be the top tier, but you wind up mm-hmm. just being one of the 10. You know, the only reason mm-hmm. you've heard of Flyway Courageous or Joe Every Kind is because we spent $100,000 on public loops and people who grease the palms of record companies and radio stations and all that. That's the only reason you heard about us. Right. And because there was an outlet for them talking to friends that are music publicists, but then also I had a friend stop by yesterday who works PR for GM. Like he worked for GM. He's just here for Nissan, like cars. Everybody needs a car to get somewhere. And he's saying that even his job's getting harder because these companies, even car magazines, nobody's buying car magazines. So these companies aren't paying publicists anymore. They're paying influencers on social media to like exactly eat an egg roll in the back of their new SUV or something like that because people (laughs) want to see that. Like the whole system everywhere is getting up. It's changing. Yeah. Even I started putting out records in 2014 and I felt like. I've had good press over the years where I've been reviewed by the New York Times and Rolling Stone. And like even in the last 10 years of having that, that doesn't change your life. Maybe a few more people come to your show and you and learned about you. But you spent so much money to get, you know, and whether it was like my record label or whatever. And that the impact of those big press things getting smaller and smaller and musicians are like, this is crazy. We're still spending all this money on publicists, even when they can get something. And when can they even get something? Does it make a difference? And then I have lots of friends who are publicists and they're like, we have a thankless job. Everyone's mad at us all the time and we can't get (laughs) we can't get people to review records anymore. They don't do song premieres. We don't even know where to go. And, you know, the whole ecosystem is dramatically changing. Dramatically changing. Yeah, the publicist basically right now is the best you hope for is get you on Jimmy Kimmel or something like that. Right. And you're never going to get you're never going to get on Jimmy Kimmel without a publicist. I don't care. Right. If Jimmy Kimmel himself comes to see you and likes you, he's going to want to call your publicist. Getting songs in the soundtracks and things, I think, are probably one of the biggest goals you could have if you're going to make try to make money in this mm-hmm. business mm-hmm. is trying to get the Sopranos soundtrack, the little band from Birmingham that suddenly the Sopranos um, change your life. Yeah. yeah. Any given year, like 50% of what I do is for sync and writing for licensing with people. And we're sitting down here, I'm sitting down with like people that have deals with like major publishers, like they're great writers can like really just cut to the bone on like a writing like an artist song. We're sitting here writing songs specifically to be placed on right. TV and all of that. So I have this conversation with a lot of artists like, man, I'd love to get into sync. And I'm like, cool, I can't rely on it. And I specifically <laughs> write songs to be placed on TV. Sometimes it's great. There's times where it's six months and it's crickets, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's just a hustle in a different direction. The six month crickets is really <laughs> weird. Yeah. I yeah, it's our question. Yeah, and everything. you're like, I'm gonna give it up, and then the next day, then you get an email like, Hey, you just placed a song. Okay, I'm not giving it up. <laughs> yeah. Great, cool. Another three months. Here we go. Yeah, the yeah. only the only advantage that we have, the only really good thing that I see out of that over the last forty years was that in 1988. 89, 90, when Fly My Courageous came out. It came out in 91, I think. But when that came out, our second record, Whisper Tim's Lion, was cut out from Ireland. If you wanted to hear it, you had to find a record store and somebody would have had to have bought it and then returned it and Whoa. sold it as used because there was no way for you to hear that song, mm-hmm. to hear that record. You were wow. never going to hear that record 
So that's one thing that I didn't like when everybody was Napster, everybody's talking about streaming in my position where I am. I don't know where I am. I reside in the zeitgeist, but at least I know that my music, if somebody in China or India or if someone wants to hear Kevin Kinney's song, they can actually find it right. and listen to it. I have to tell them that they do it, but at least they don't <laughs> have to hear about it and then try to drive try to track it down. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that in my own world, I'm not losing millions of dollars. Like I'm sure that some of these artists were getting publishing checks in the millions and now they get 500,000 or something where it's mm -hmm. like drastically different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was getting $800. Now I get three or four. I mean, I could see where Metallica would be like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> we made $11 million <laughs> a year on that. Now we're making $4 million or $1 million or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That percentage just doesn't really matter. And it's not really hurting me. It's one expensive dinner difference a year, you know. So basically, I feel like the summary of this conversation is the music business is crazy and always has been. <laughs> There's pros and cons to the past and the present and be yourself and do it because you need to do it for yourself, for your own healing. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, in my life, like I tell people that want me to produce them, I say, I can only make you sound like me. I, I don't know how to make you. A good producer can say, I want to sound like this and they can help you, guide you through that. I can only be me. But yeah. I, I appreciate all the other me's out there. I appreciate the Axl Roses and the Kiss. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I love ACDC and I love Joan Armour Trayton and I love I love them all. I love yeah. Billy Eilers. I love the Allman Brothers and all sorts of stuff. There's always an audience for authenticity. And uh, you know, maybe someday if we just keep making records and keep putting them out there, you know, just maybe you'll have an amazing box set someday. <laughs> someone will find you. You know, I always have hope that someone will find me. Yeah. 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 You know, we're creating but, things that are going to hopefully outlast us. That's a good goal. Like you say, I think that sums it up right. Just be yourself and do what you do and try to limit your frustrations because, you know, when I, I don't know what to do about it. I can't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Just to bring the mill worker analogy back in, just like keep showing up to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like the positive way to end it is to be yeah. just keep doing what we're all doing and try to yeah. be grateful for our little corners mm -hmm. and uh, connecting with each other through being ourselves. And be local. I am 100% local, organic. <laughs> grass fed pasture I'm grass fed local I'm organic I'm gonna be here once a month if you need to come see me play I'll yeah. be here so, yeah, yeah I, I, would, I think if you're feeling frustrated just play your fr best friend or get a residency at a coffee shop and mm -hmm. make that yours make yeah. it just yeah. do it every Monday night it'll be very freeing to you yeah just play you and your yeah. girlfriend or your dog yeah so I love that beautiful yeah. thank you for carving up the time this morning to sit with us and have this conversation. Well, keep on, keep on. It's nice to meet y'all. And I love your Me interview too. with Edward. That was very sweet. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks for joining us for this one. Thank All you. Right. See ya. Bye. Okay. Bye. Hey, real quick before we wrap up today's episode, it takes a lot to produce even a small show like ours. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider taking a minute to check out our Patreon. There's a lot happening over there, all with the intent of growing our community and offering you more resources to navigate a career based on your art more sustainably. You can learn more at the link in the show notes below. Thanks for being here with us, and we'll catch you next time on the Other 22 Hours podcast.